Okay, mm -hmm. let me start with, uh, uh, or uh, let, let me explain the basic, the, the basic background here. Like, I was li listening to you on uh, Thursday, local time, on mm -hmm. Prague uh, City Data Congress. So this is basically a follow-up interview, uh, okay. I would say. That's great. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but I, I will start with something like uh, I was kind of forced to do well, well, in, the, in my podcast to, to cover also the COVID related topics and uh, okay. and this is a great opportunity for me because I'm really uh, amazed by the numbers mm -hmm. uh, you uh, I wanted to say scored but that's not a good <laughs> expression no it's, it's <laughs> a very macabre humor <laughs> yeah uh, but uh, the numbers are extremely low like only mm -hmm. uh, I am uh, using the the Google numbers right now so it's like 442 confirmed cases mm -hmm. uh, and only about seven deaths That's and it's really been a month it's been a month with no local confirmed cases so it's largely over for us yeah how, mm -hmm. how did you manage that because mm -hmm. what was interesting for me uh, that you said on, on Thursday that you're not using any location-based uh, application we're, we're not using app level uh, tracing as you mentioned we have had no lockdowns our business and schools are never closed. Uh, and so this is um, because we acted very fast. We started our response last year. Many jurisdictions started only this year. That's the crucial difference. And also the fairness of the supply of masks and so on, that is also essential. Uh, we see the mask for all campaign and that is great. Uh, but we started that, um, I think in February, if not January. Uh, and also uh, I think the fun of everybody communicating in a way that sees the humor being used so actively, not only by the government official and their spokes dog, but also by every scientist involved. They get into this co-learning culture with the entire population. That I think uh, is the often missed part of the social innovation because that makes everybody feel, oh, I can contribute to the counter coronavirus. It's not just a government thing. Yeah. Uh, what was interesting, you, you mentioned this kind of like data related uh, uh, way to deal with, with the crisis. When mm -hmm. you basically followed the information on mm -hmm. social media and mm -hmm. then reacted based on some, yes. uh, some uh, let's say, checked data. Well, it's um, basically agenda setting by the crowd. Right. So if you have sufficient amount of people who are informed or at least have an amateur level of knowledge uh, just by the algorithm of upvoting, you can see what's trending, what's the important topics on a given area. This is exactly as how Reddit works. Yeah. So basically, because you reacted like based on the Taiwanese version of Reddit uh, mm -hmm. uh, information, That's... you basically uh, installed uh, the health checks on, mm -hmm. on, uh, on airports, mm -hmm. is, is it right? Yeah, that, that's right. And we set up the uh, health checks for flights coming from Wuhan uh, January 1st. So that's the first day of this year. So way earlier than pretty much everybody else. And also our Central Epidemic Command Center was set up even before we had a local confirmed case. Yeah. So like basically this is somehow a part of the very open approach of Taiwanese mm -hmm. government yes. because like it's yes. not only about uh, not yes. only about like sh sharing the data with, with society mm -hmm. with, with your with your uh, uh, people with your citizens but also mm -hmm. let's the say other using direction. their yeah using that's their right. data basically yes yes yeah. so do you think that's that's something we and by we I mean <laughs> the rest of the world probably <laughs> is uh, uh, that, that's something we need to learn from this situation. Definitely. And Taiwan did not start to be uh, a perfect um, score, uh, according to your words, um, in SARS, right? Back in 2003, our um, communication channel is very chaotic. Our municipality government and our central government says very different things. We had to barricade an entire hospital unannounced and there was no uh, fixed date of termination. Uh, and so it's all very traumatic. And I think we learned from it, knowing that it's only through collective intelligence, it's only through everybody becoming kind of like an amateur epidemiologist 
can we uh, fight the COVID together? In the beginning, we didn't know that uh, the novel coronavirus uh, is different from SARS. So we just uh, treat it as if SARS has happened all over again. But it turns out it's not SARS. It's even more difficult with an even higher Arnold value. And so we had to improvise on a lot of things, uh, including but not limited to the digital fence which is uh, the alternative to the quarantine hotel. If you return to Taiwan, you want to go to a quarantine hotel, we do that and we pay you a daily stipend. But many people, if it's 14 days, they prefer to stay in their home if they're not living with people in the vulnerable uh, groups. And if they do so, then we use their phone uh, and use the cell phone tower signal to make sure that they do not escape uh, the digital fence. And that is, of course, compromising the privacy uh, and the freedom of movement, but uh, compared to, for example, a wristband or any other invasive technology uh, or GPS-based technology, uh, it's actually uh, much more coarse-grained because using cell phone tower triangulation, we only know about a 50 meters radius. And so it's uh, not as invasive as GPS. And also it's time defined, right? It's just 14 days after which there's no constitutional basis for us to uh, track the whereabouts and to send SMS to the uh, household managers or to the um, police. So my point is that people know uh, the epidemiologic reason of why doing so, so they can improve the process. For example, writing chatbots that automates the checks and so on without uh, compromising the value because the value according to the constitution is to protect the public health and we never declare a emergency situation so everything we do need to be congress approved it need to be accountable to the parliament and it need to work in non-coronavirus days as well so that makes um, our innovations much more uh, transmissible uh, to the rest of the world because you don't need uh, to make a constitutional exception to use the taiwan model yeah and also, like when you're talking about the let's say bridge into into your uh, mm -hmm. uh, privacy with this with this uh, yeah. digital fence, uh, mm -hmm. I guess there's there's the line like that, that's that's exactly the point like where when you uh, kind of like breaking the privacy, but with uh, uh, let's say voluntarily like I can choose mm -hmm. that you you will or, or will mm -hmm. not do that. So there's mm -hmm. probably yeah. uh, some kind of like uh, border between like. Being, being, I don't say well, volatile in this in, in this uh, mm -hmm. meetings and in this uh, uh, use cases and uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm kind of I'm kind of like uh, going there like w w to the question of the of the uh, keeping your data private because that's mm -hmm. you something you mentioned on Thursday too like that's that's why you didn't uh, use the the location based app but this is mm -hmm. kind of like a little bit same but not that invasive. That's, that's exactly right. So um, the point of the uh, cell tower triangulation is that it's just for home quarantine. It's a defined part of population. And for people who uh, they, we don't know that they are not infectious, uh, who are suspectly uh, infectious, which is what quarantine means, right? Um, that uh, the constitutional uh, principle defines because of the uh, act about communicable diseases for these people, we have the constitutional basis to do a time limited 14 days in this case, uh, tracking of their whereabouts. And the constitutional court says, even though it may be constitutional to barricade with no other choice, like just to confine them in a quarantine hotel, we need to find more humane alternatives if it's at all possible. So that's why the home quarantine, instead of everybody going into the quarantine hotels. But we still do provide quarantine hotel if you don't like the idea of digital fence. And also we still provide a quarantine hotel if you don't have your own apartment or if you uh, would be forced to live with uh, people in the vulnerable um, groups, which put even more people uh, in danger. And so the idea is that if the human right um, of this entire process is guaranteed by the accountability to the parliament and to everybody who care to ask, then we're uh, staying good uh, on the constitutional uh, side of things. If we collect this data for other purposes, other than ensuring the quarantine, then we uh, extend outside the original purpose of this data collection, which is why we prefer not to collect new data. This uh, data uh, triangulation is chosen precisely because the telecom providers are collecting that data anyway to improve the service. 
So it doesn't require a new review of data and a breach of data if that happens, uh, what happens. We rely on the existing mechanisms to collect, to process. We just apply the data in a different way and only in a time-defined window. Okay. The reason why I'm asking, here in Czech Republic, where uh, they installed the, the app, it's called eMask, basically. Well, like very oh, simple. ours is also Resolution. called eMask. <laughs> but we use it as to pre-order mask, so I guess it's not okay. the same. <laughs> no, this is different. Like in Czech, it's a Eroška, which Eroška is Czech, Czech expression for for uh, mask. And uh, the uh, basically the principle is is very easy. It's based on on Bluetooth technology, so you won't really turn the let's say Bluetooth uh, recorder on, and you're collecting like just this just this data. Like okay, I've met somebody some other person with this app turns on and i'm not collecting any other data so it's only collecting the data of people who are who willingly installed and turned on this bluetooth app and it's kept in your phones or is it transmitted to a central registry it's in our phones and mm -hmm. when something happens you're you're uh, diagnosed with coronavirus you can share the data mm -hmm. but if you choose not to if you choose to remain a risk to the society, there's no way that the health authority knows about this. Yeah, I think so. Okay, then, then that's good. Uh, it, it, it's, it fits our principle. When we send <laughs> those um, SMS to the people who overlap uh, with potential uh, high-risk areas, this is just like sending out the SMS to um, you know, potential earthquake warnings or, or heavy rainfall or whatever. If the people choose to do nothing, uh, there's no constitutional basis for us to track them. If the people choose to, of course, do something like go to a clinic, that's far more preferred, then of course we know that they're, they're returning because they say that they received this warning. But if they don't, uh, we don't force them to. And I think uh, we agree with the Czech Republic on this one. Good. That's a that's a good news for creators of the of the mm -hmm. app, I guess. I, I would tell them <laughs> that you. Yeah, have and and if if it's open source, if everybody can see that it is actually working the way it's intended, because if it's not open source, even with the best intention, maybe it could actually do something more. But the original designer did not foresee that. So if it's open source, at least have its source code uh, published, then of course it's even better. In Taiwan, when we hold a coronavirus hackathon or cohack.tw, we ask all the entries to use the MIT license, a permissive open source license, so that everybody can apply it to different platforms, but also to make sure that uh, the developers are doing what the designers intended. Yeah. So generally, would you say that uh, the situation we're in right now has changed something about the, the approach to, to that mm -hmm. open, open source slash private data. Mm -hmm. like, do, mm -hmm. is, it, is it good idea to, let's say, push our boundaries in, in a good way, in a, with a good will to help mm -hmm. prevent the, the spread of, of coronavirus? Well, I mean, I mean uh, even though there are some data that are private, strictly speaking, there's very few individual private data. Like, um, if I, we're, we're having a video conference now, right? Uh, and so this data, this context belongs to both of us. And uh, if you go to a diagnosis, of course, the person who run the diagnosis and you both know the result. And if you even as simple as taking a photo uh, of you uh, in a party or something, uh, that uh, basically is a sh shared fact for everybody who are in the same room. So data by its nature, uh, because it's seldom the same person collecting one's own data, processing and applying it just for that so person's purpose. This is very rare. So data is social, intersectional by nature. Now it's human nature that uh, I would want to, for example, I take a photo of us, I would want to share with everybody in the same room, but I do not want any random person, much less the government, have access to the fact that I'm taking this photo with a group of people together. And the old problem was that if any of us uh, post it to social media, then we basically uh, compromised the negotiation bargaining power of everybody else because then that social media company will have not have to ask the other people in the same room for that selfie. They have that selfie uh, already. And so this coronavirus, I think, because the data involved is not as uh, simple as a photo that's taken uh, in a party. It is actually health data, uh, the more sensitive ones. You still share it, but you likely only share it with people who you trust to act in your best interest. You share it with your doctor and nurse. 
if the contact tracer, the medical office come to you, of course you share it with them. You probably share it with your family and probably not, no, nobody else then. So the challenge is how we build a data um, collaborative that only allows uh, your preferred, your comfortable amount of sharing. And for everybody else, it shares in a way that is aggregate or statistics that still improve the public health, but without com compromising your privacy. That is the challenge. I'm happy to see the Czech Republic rising to the challenge by designing an app like that. Yeah, the, the thing is that what I was surprised a little bit that uh, the let's say the share on market of this of this app is really small. Uh, uh, it's like okay, Czech Republic has about 10 million. Uh, people living here, and the the last number I know is uh, about I don't know 300,000 uh, users. So that's pretty low for me. I would expect that uh, when it's uh, right now is that uh, we're in the talks like this this app being included in some uh, governmental let's say program anti COVID program. Mm -hmm. Probably, like, uh, probably mm -hmm. there's a more specific expression, but I cannot find it right now. Mm -hmm. But uh, so, what I was a little bit surprised that even uh, the techie people, the young generation, was still afraid to install the app and uh, mm -hmm. to share the data or basically collect the data because the sharing is the, is the last step and that's well, all important. Yeah. Um, however, I, I think that's healthy suspicion. I, I wouldn't say that um, we, we should blindly trust uh, the apps. Uh, if it were me, I would insist on seeing an independent audit on the cybersecurity side. And also, because I know how to code, I will also look at the source code at how it was developed before choosing to install. And in a sense, this is a, a good uh, practice, uh, both in cybersecurity and digital competence. It's just that with the um, time pressure, of course, people will want to uh, have a wider uh, dissemination of this app. And so <clears throat> I think one of the point of using the digital fence is, again, because we use it in a way that doesn't require collecting new data. And we use it in a way that's very clearly marked in its purposes. So um, I think for contact tracing, if people can see that this somehow benefits them, for example, it's an app that traces my whereabouts, but I don't share it. I don't broadcast any Bluetooth. This is strictly my diary. And then when the contact tracer come to me, uh, I can generate a one-time use um, website uh, to them, a one-time one URL to them, and it's containing only contact tracing relevant information and, and without sacrificing any other families or friends' privacy information, then that I will be willing to uh, install because it serves primary in my self-interest because nobody wants to divulge uh, unnecessary privacy information of their friends and families if the contact tracers come to find them. And so this helps me and also incidentally helps other people. However, if you build an app as something that primarily helps the other people and, and of negligible use of that person, then it's a harder sell. And this is why for medical mask, we say this protects you because it doesn't uh, you know, uh, make you want to touch your face all the time. It reminds you to wash your hands properly. And that's why we wear a mask. And we don't say you wear a mask to protect other people. That would be a harder sell. Yeah. The thing, like uh, you've mentioned it before, I guess, uh, the open source principle uh, that you would check, or at least you would want to know how the app mm -hmm. was was coded yes. and whatsoever. Yes. So for like for future events, and unfortunately, we can expect something will happen mm -hmm. again, something mm -hmm. like that, something like this this situation. So maybe in the future we should. Uh, uh, I would say like to not to force, but mm -hmm. we, sh we or at least the government should want to be open source in these mm -hmm. uh, these apps and these uh, let's say let's say precautions to to uh, to be open about what we do or what they do to pr mm -hmm. protect our health and mm -hmm. how they do that. That's exactly right. If people already use that sort of apps uh, in non-coronavirus, non-pandemic situations. Uh, for example, I can easily think of the kind of uh, personal log as something that people with chronic diseases, they will probably also want to use it because they want to uh, uh, their phone to remind themselves to change their habits for the better, uh, for precision health purposes and so on. And so if you add those functionalities, then it becomes something that people are willing to work with every day 
and also they trust uh, more because the more data they feed it, they know that nobody uh, can do a security breach or something uh, that compromises their security. So when pandemic happens, you just say, oh, by the way, here is a new field that uh, you report whether you have a fever, for example. And, and then people will be much more willing to use that app compared to a uh, greenfield uh, application. You, you've, you've mentioned that, that basically you uh, at the beginning you reacted as SARS was happening again and then that's right that's uh, and then we uh, discovered that SARS 2.0 yeah yeah and that's the the last time SARS actually happened uh, the Taiwanese government was not mm -hmm. that prepared not so no not, not at all not at all yeah so I guess you you had the process of learning in between these two situations but what what have you learned? right now like within this situation what, what i guess there still was some some i don't know space space for <laughs> some new and new experiences yeah well um, first of all everybody should learn epidemiology uh learning why soap works why uh the hand sprays work these remain the most important technology everything else is just adding to that but if you look at the r uh not value um and really soap uh, and hand sanitation in general and physical distancing, they dominate the factors. Everything else uh, is good, contact tracing and things like that if they're necessary. Um, but uh, if you don't do these two, then everything is doomed. Uh, and so I think knowing why the epidemiological model uh, and with playable simulations, I often recommend people to play a simulation by Nikki Case uh, and that simulation, I think, is one of the best uh, that I've encountered so far uh, that explains exactly how epidemiology works and wh what individuals, uh, instead of uh, being anxious, can do in a day-to-day -day way to spread the right message uh, on how to mitigate the coronavirus. And if you uh, get into the habit of sharing what you have learned, then the scientific knowledge have a higher R value than conspiracy theories. <laughs> And, and only then can the civil society mobilize uh, into a collective intelligence think tank and do tank uh, to counter the coronavirus instead of waiting uh, for uh, you know one or two people to make uh, incidentally the right decision. And that's not the Taiwan model. Yeah, uh, we're kind of getting to the end, but uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask about something which really, really amused me on, on Thursday. There was okay. your humor over rumor tech. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, that's, the dog, yeah. And the bottom. Really, I, on, huh? on, the, on one hand, it's really simple. I totally get the 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 importance and and mm -hmm. uh, basically the, the principle. Yeah. But uh, maybe, can you explain, like, how did you get there? Like, because mm -hmm. it's, that's kind of courageous, like, to, to have your... Well, yeah, we, we, we got there because... Yeah, because we, we have no other choice, right? In, in Taiwan, uh, we pride ourselves in being the only country in Asia, uh, according to Civicus Monitor, that has a complete freedom of speech and press. And a journalist's word is as good as a minister's word. And for many other jurisdictions in our vicinity, that's not the case. When the disinformation crisis took everybody, all the liberal democracies by surprise, there's many jurisdictions that says, okay, then let's just give the administration more power. Maybe they can do a takedown. Maybe they can do a lockdown. Well, in the infosphere, not the city. Um, and, and that, of course, is the easy solution. But then it decimates trust from the citizens. And it also shows that the government is not trusting the citizen enough to entertain different ideas. And for the things that are intentional that causes public harm, of course, there should be a response strategy. It's just takedowns actually angers even more people because those conspiracy theories thrive on outrage already. And so if you take it down, people are even more outrageous uh, about the takedown itself. So how to counter the infodemic, this information, even intentional malicious ones without resorting to takedown is kind of the uh, question posed to Taiwan, and we can answer only by innovating because there's no existing playbook for that. All the easy answers that compromise the uh, privacy and the freedom, we cannot choose. And so we have to try all sorts of different things. And it turns out that humor is pretty much the only thing that worked. Uh, and rapid response, of course. And so a quick 
humor over rumor turns out to be the most um, welcomed response from the citizens and from the civil society because then you work with journalists instead of against journalists and no solution that I know of that work against journalists can win in this information uh, space. Plus you're Plus showing you're... this this open source uh, principle again mm -hmm. because you the part of the of the thing is not only the humor but uh, mm -hmm. as you mentioned on the on the example of the the uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. issue paper rumor yes. like that you yes. you actually shown them like what is what what is produced exactly. where and so on mm -hmm. yeah. yes so it's about remixes it's about allowing uh, the comedic uh, professionals uh, to to have the full reign but the payload is still very serious clarification if you only have what's funny but there is no point in the fun then people don't share it voluntarily. They maybe just share it for the laugh, but they don't add their own message and their own reading into it. And adding their own message and reading ensure that they internalize that scientific knowledge and can make useful contributions to the community. If this is just something that's funny, followed with uh, something that's clarifying, that's scientific, these two doesn't connect uh, in the mind. And so the conspiracy theory will then still have the opportunity to sow this court. If you have a adversary or many adversaries uh, at that, that tries to sow this court, your only consistent response would be to make each message stand alone by itself so that when people see it before seeing the conspiracy theories, they have a vaccination effect. So that the next time they see the rumor, they say, hey, we, I laughed about it. It's not like that. And, and that's when you know you have succeeded in the humor over rumor playbook. Final question. Aren't you afraid that when you, in, in the future, there's going to be a different prime minister that he's not going to be like that funny? He's not going to have that sense of humor? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, our um, vice premier is also very funny, uh, but <laughs> what I'm trying to get at is that this is a culture. When the ministry see that the premier tries this and it works very well, the people who are involved gets promoted. The author of that, uh, we only have one pair of bottom each, gets promoted from being an assistant to the premier, is now our administration spokesperson, our official spokesperson for the government. So everybody and their comedian friends see that this is really the one true way. <laughs> if you want to get into the communication uh, in the government, you better start uh, making friends with professional comedians. Uh, and so I think it has become a culture. It's not a top-down thing. It's just people realizing the science behind it and the kind of mental pathways that we can take uh, from the single kind of thing that makes us upset you can go to outrage or you can go to humor, and these are mutually exclusive. This is basic science um, of the mind that people are starting to understand and applying it into public communication. Great, perfect. Thank you for your time. I'm really glad you, you connected.